My name is Tamira Davis, and I'm uh, with the, the University of Illinois at Chicago, Office of Technology Management, and the HTI Proof of Concept Incubator on campus. And we are hosting with the uh, Illinois University Incubator Network. Uh, Sherry Saladay is here with me as well. We are hosting the FBIR webinar today, um, and we're we apologize for the last minute change. Uh, hopefully it's made it a little bit more convenient for those that are joining us uh, through webinar. We do have a few people that are here on site that will be participating in the webinar um, from here. And then Annalisa is at, you know, at another location. So please bear with us if there are any technical difficulties. Um, we will try and get through this as seamlessly as possible. Um, I'll pass it over to Sherry. My name is Sherry Soliday. I'm with the Illinois University Incubator Network. I'm talking way too fast. <laughs> um, so one thing I just want to bring to your attention today, um, we did put, I just drop a brochure in the um, repository where the slides are, and um, it does talk about um, SBIR counseling that is available for researchers in Cook County. So and this, this is like a few free hours. To meet with Annalisa to go over like ideas for SBIR proposal or to have her review your proposal that you've already drafted or just to ask a few other questions. It is just a few hours. It probably won't, our free hours won't take you through the entire project, but it can offer a lot of insight, guidance, and assistance, and she does a great job. So um, I'm going to turn it over to you, Annalisa. Great, great. Okay, and then thanks so much, Sherry, and I'll, I'll let you know uh, once the advanced slides. Um, so uh, thanks for everyone um, who's uh, you know who's here today, uh, whether you know in person or, or virtual, like me. Um, thanks for taking the time out to discuss something that's you know uh, very near and dear to me, and that's um, you know fundings for small fundings for uh, for small businesses. So if you go to slide two, um, you know just a, a little bit about me. Um, I've been working with early stage startups uh, for the past 16 years in different capacities. Um, so I actually also I previously worked at the OTM over at UIC. Um, I also worked in uh, venture capital, uh, co-managing a uh, life science portfolio over there. Uh, started in, in my own um, med device company and have been playing uh, senior management roles um, in a number of life science startups. Um, so currently, uh, I'm the COO of a spin-out out of um, Northwestern, um, developing a, a wearable technology. Um, and I also, um, as Sherry mentioned, am, am part of the Illinois University Incubator Network, which is fabulous. Um, you know, they do um, a whole lot of things for, for startups, you know, b beyond um, this, you know, these, you know, SBIR and SPPR uh, consulting services. So check that out when you get a chance. Um, and then just all the icons here are just um, organizations uh, that I've been a part of. So not only startups, but also, um, you know, uh, universities and organizations. So we can uh, skip to the next slide, slide three on grant successes. So in terms of my, uh, my experience with um, SBIRs and STTRs, I've been working on them for a really long time, um, since 2008. Um, and I've helped uh, companies uh, get, uh, you know, all, all types of funding within this mechanism, um, you know, uh, totaling over $30 million. So both, so from the NIH, the NSF, the, and the DOD, and um, through each of these experiences, whether it was uh, getting funding for my own companies or, or that of clients, uh, one thing holds true, and that is uh, non-dilutive funding uh, can be a company's best friend. So for those who of you who may not be familiar uh, with the terminology of non-dilutive funding, essentially um, this is uh, you know, funding that you get from another party, and in this case, uh, the government, um, you know, uh, without giving up any of your equity. So you don't have to give up um, you know, a, piece of, a piece of your uh, pie and ownership of your company. Um, but before I go further, um, you know, as far as questions, I'm not sure how we want to handle that, uh, Sherry. Um, if we just kind of want to wait after a couple of slides or people can kind of just, um, you know, chime in. I'm not, I'm not really sure, especially for those that are joining in remotely. Yeah, okay. So, you mean as far as if folks have questions? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, right. I think that's probably a, 
are probably to like pause every now and then and ask folks if they have questions. It would be good if they, they'll need to unmute themselves um, to ask a question and then just go back on mute when they're done. But since we are doing so much remote, it's good to just like every couple of slides to ask folks. Okay, great, great, thanks. So if we go to uh, slide four, um, the agenda. So uh, what I'm gonna go over today is give you all an overview on what this great program is, this SBR and SPPR program, as well as which um, governmental agencies participate in the program, um, as well as an overview on those individual agencies. Um, then I'll go over um, you know, some grant application tips um, that I've learned from doing this for a while. Um, also present some you know, different resources that you might want to look into. If this is something that um, you definitely want to do for your, for your startup. And then uh, we can, uh, you know, uh, you know, just have a you know, discussion in terms of you know, taking your questions um, and things like that. So if we advance to slide five, um, as far as an overview about this SBIR and SCPR program. So SBIR, SCPR stands for Small Business Innovation Research and Small Business Technology Transfer Program. So what it is, it essentially is a huge program uh, for for-profit uh, businesses like yours or yours that you're thinking about spinning out um, from the university or just coming up with on your own. So the program uh, provides a lot of money, over $2 billion, um, you know, for the main applicant and the main applicant is the startup, so your company. Um, essentially, they're, you know, um, uh, research projects uh, that whose funding would be used to develop uh, new products or services but um, you know the, these technologies have to be innovative, uh, unproven uh, concepts and, and technology. And we can dig a little bit into that in, in, in subsequent slides. So if you go to slide six, um, in terms of uh, the mission of this program, you know this is to support. Um, I have underlined here scientific excellence and technological innovation, um, and I emphasize that because you know. Um, this is supposed to fund um, the R&D, uh, R&D projects, so to further develop, um, you know, uh, technologies that, that you may be working on. So this wouldn't be funding things like, uh, you know, marketing or, or sales efforts, you know, those sort of things. So it has to fund um, R&D um, because, you know, this is a set aside money by the government specifically for um, research areas of interest by each of um, the institutions um, to support, you know, the priorities of those organizations. So maybe I'll just pause for a second. Does anyone have any, any questions um, uh, so far? No? Okay, great. I have a question. So if you go to slide, oh, sure. Hi, this is Steve Ackerman. Go ahead. Um, in terms of I breakdown see. between SBIR and STTR, um, mm -hmm. I've been told there's a lot more money for SBIR than STTR. How much does that impact kind of success in, um, in these applications? And is that something to consider? Yeah, yeah. Um, so there is a, you know, it, it also, that, I think that also the funding also depends on the particular agency and institutes within that agency. So my suggestion uh, would be that um, you submit an application uh, that is, I guess, that is best suited for your company's situation. And I'll go into it in, in a couple of slides, but you know, one of the main differences between the two mechanisms has to do where the PI is primarily employed. Um, so, you know, in an in STTR, um, you know, situation, the PI can be employed at the university or at the small business concern but where in, in SBIR, the PI needs to be primarily employed at the small at the small business concern. So, you know, depending on your situation, I would submit um, that uh, you know for the uh, solicitation that is best suited for your business's situation. Um, you know, I think I think you know there if there's more funding um, in a particular program, you might just have to cater, you know, adjust your team, um, you know, accordingly. But this is really a case by case basis. Okay. Yeah. So we have another question here. Annalise, sure. go ahead. Um, I just want to know at what stage, this is Kathy Phillips, um, at what stage um, is this feasible? In other words, 
does it must it lead to a a commercialized is something that can be commercialized uh, fairly quickly? Um, there was some understanding last time I talked to somebody in SBIR and STDR that it had to lead to a commercial product. Is that correct? Great question, Kathy. Yes, um, it has to. Co so the purpose of um, SBIR and STTR funding is to fund R and D for the development of a commercial product or service. So it couldn't be. You, you can't use this this funding for basic science research. So that's you know that's that type of funding is more you know NIH R type grants. Um, this funding is specifically for the development of of products or services um, that will, that whose, whose hope is to hit the market. Great. Um, any other questions before we move on? Okay, these are great questions. Okay, so if we go to um, slide seven, um, as far as the, the program goals, okay. So, and I think this also helps answer some of the questions. Um, is that this program is to stimulate technological innovation in order to meet um, the the needs of uh, individual, um, you know, research institutions, organizations rather like the NIH and NSF. Um, another goal of the program is to also, you know, encourage uh, participation in in the um, in this innovation. For certain certain groups, um, like uh, women or socially or economically disadvantaged people, um, and then also another big goal, um, and this last point is important, is that um, this funding is meant to, in in some ways, to help you attract additional funding, and uh, that would be private sector funding. So it could be in the form of you know angel VC or um, you know uh, partnerships with you know, uh, big companies. So, you know, I think one of the things about this type of funding, it's it's often the first dollar in for a lot of startups. And uh, one of the program goals is that this will help you attract additional dollars, um, you know, from those outside parties. Um, and I think an important thing to, uh, to realize here also is that these organizations also do not want to be your sole source of funding. Um, you know, to get a drug or a device, um, and even um, uh, you know, service that has you know, um, you know, technology, um, underlying technology within it. Um, you know, the SBR and SCTR program, um, you know, believes that you will need funding outside uh, of them in addition to them. So um, it is you know, again, it is a goal that this this early funding will help enable that. So. If we go to uh, slide eight, um, I'd like to talk about, you know, some of the, the differences uh, within the SBIR and STTR program. So, um, you know, you know, both of these programs, um, you know, are are set aside uh, funding has set aside funding, you know, for small businesses. Again, the small business is the main applicant. You can you can have subcontracts to you know, research universities in, in either in either uh, program, SBR and STTR, but, um, you know, the the main difference is that, um, you know, with an STTR program, you are required to partner with the research institution, uh, but with an SBIR, it's an option. And then we can go into that um, a little bit more in subsequent slides. So if we go to slide nine, I'd like to just kind of, you know, uh, provide, you know, a further high level overview of, of the program. Um, this is, you know, this, this $2 billion, over $2 billion a year uh, uh, program is something that's mandated by, by Congress. So, um, you know, we're, we're actually good on the, on the program for uh, another two years, but, you know, um, it's, it's, it's one of those programs that has been um, continuously funded. So it'll probably be, uh, you know, funded Again, um, in terms of kind of like the agencies that are, are participating, um, you know, this includes the, the DOD, uh, HHS, which is Health and Human Services, National Science Foundation, um, and others. So there's a lot of, um, you know, uh, federal agencies participating uh, in this program. Some have both SBIR and STTR, some just have SBIR. 
um, and we can go into that in, in a couple other slides. Um, I think for this slide, I, I just want to, again, stress I have here in bold towards the bottom that um, this the SBR and SPTR program um, is not meant to be an alternative source of funding for basic research. Um, I've been, you know, working on these drugs for a long time, and I often hear from PIs and research labs that say, you know, this could just fund some, you know, additional work in my lab. I don't really need to have the company. That is not the case. Um, a company does need to be performed. The company has to have, you know, controlled facilities in which they would perform work, but they can subcontract um, to a university uh, to fund work going on over there, but it's not, um, you know, a funding source solely um, just for the university. So maybe I'll just pause there for a second in, in case there are, are questions. Okay, great. So if we go to slide 10, um, so let's see. Okay, uh, slide 10. Okay, great. So um, again, this, you know, this type of funding is, is non-diluted. You don't have to give them any equity. Um, this is meant to, you know, fund uh, a company um, to pay for um, things like, you know, employees, um, you know, office space, lab space, any resources uh, that, that you might need. And again, this, this funding is, is meant to fund the, the development or, uh, or of a product or a service that has, you know, some uh, high risk um, associated with that, with that innovation that can lead to um, the commercialization of that product or service. Um, this this program is multi-phased, so um, you know there's there's an opportunity to get a lot of funding, um, you know, for the development uh, of your of your research, and it's funded. Uh, you know, it, it's divided into three different phases. Uh, phase one um, is uh, a feasibility study. You know, is this is this possible? Is this research, you know, uh, project, um, you know, even possible? And that type of funding, you know, depending on the agency, ranges anywhere between eighty thousand on the very low end um, uh, to two hundred fifty thousand dollars or more. And I just want to stress the sometimes more part uh, for for these different phases. Um, depending on the agency and even institutes within the agency, there could be even higher budgets for phase one. Um, you know, these phase one grants are typically up to a year. You can have it, you know, um, anywhere, typically it's between six months up to a year. Um, but these these grants, um, some of them can, can fund well over $250,000. I've, I've worked with some companies that have gotten, you know, grants um, over 300,000, over 500,000. It really depends on the project you're proposing and the institute that you're targeting and what kind of budgets um, that they may have. So if this is something of interest to you, um, you know, uh, and you know, you might require a budget that's over, you know, 250,000, then I encourage you to, to reach out to the agency to see what the limit may be for, um, may be for your project because you don't want to, Kind of sell yourself short. Um, so that's phase one. Phase two um, is a project that can go typically up to two years. Um, certainly you can get no cost extensions uh, for, for these programs through most of the agencies. Um, but you know the program's typically two years and it can range anywhere between seven hundred fifty thousand dollars um, to a million dollars, again sometimes more. And then at phase three, that's the commercialization phase. So this is the phase in which the agency say, okay, um, you know, we're, we're kind of done funding this project. We're expecting you to either commercialize or seek, you know, additional funding by, you know, other means, whether it's angel venture or some sort of strategic partnership. Um, but uh, I will say there are some uh, agencies like the NSF and NIH, which I imagine a lot of those in the audience today are, are targeting given, you know, your, um, you know, life science background. Um, there are phase two B grants. So that's, that's funding between phase two and phase three. And that would fund, um, you know, sometimes even um, commercial related um, efforts that um, can complement R&D efforts. So that could be, that could fund some, um, you know, uh, additional 
you know, clinical trials, manufacturing, that sort of thing. So that's all agency specific and that type of funding um, actually ranges anywhere between 500,000 and, and some agencies like the NIH up to $3 million. So I'll go into phase 2B grants in, in a little bit, but I just want to give you an overview of, um, you know, what the phases are and the funding that can be um, achieved uh, within each of them. So if we go to slide 11. Um, in terms of we move on. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, um, in terms of the uh, funding amounts, is that is that direct costs or is it direct plus indirect? That's the total. So total. if you go back to slide nine, um, where is this 15,000 uh, foot view? Oh, actually, sorry, slide 10, sorry, slide 10, sorry. So, um, you know, that's a, that's a great question. So, um, like for, for phase one, I have some number in phase two, I have some numbers there, that is, that's all in. So just a total, so that's direct, indirect, and a line item called a fee. Um, so that's that's kind of, um, that's what's available. All right, thanks. Sure, no problem. Hi Please. there, my name is uh, Navi Grish, I'm from Biomsense. Uh, thank you, thanks so much for this uh, workshop. Um, my question is, in terms of budgeting, what are the most valid things to put on a budget as opposed to things that, you know, are seen as, you know, uh, just you're trying to fill up a budget? Sure, sure, no, that's a great question. I'm, um, I'm familiar with why I'm sense. Uh, I think you work with Kevin, told him I said hi. So as far as the budget, um, the budget is, is divided into three buckets, okay? So that's direct cost, indirect cost, and a fee. So as far as direct cost, that can include things like uh, line items that are directly related to the project. So that would be personnel who is actually doing R&D. So you wouldn't put, you know, for direct costs like um, someone that's doing business development or, you know, CEO time that is not doing, um, not performing R&D. So you would put only in personnel that is working directly on the project. Uh, that go the same goes for any travel. If you're traveling to trial sites, for instance, that's a direct cost. Materials uh, directly related to the project, that's direct cost. So not office supplies, but like, you know, materials like reagents, chemicals, whatever, that's, that's direct cost. Um, indirect cost, the other bucket, um, that is a percentage um, of your direct cost which you don't need to itemize in the grant, but um, that's something that your accountant will look through as well as the federal agency's accountants will, will look through. And typically that indirect cost rate is 40%, and that includes things like rent, um, uh, you know, some, uh, you know, some uh, travel, you know, not directly related to the project, internet, things like that. Um, and then, and then finally, the last item is the fee, and um, typically that's no greater than 7% of the sum of the total direct costs and indirect costs. And that's really, that, that money is at, to be used at the discretion um, of the company. You can kick it back to a subcontractor like a university. You can pay for, you know, um, you know additional material, that sort of thing. So, Whatever cost you want to put in your budget in any of those three buckets, being again direct, indirect, and fee, um, you know those costs have to be um, uh, uh, spent um, for uh, for 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 things based in the U.S. So you actually can't pay for anything international. So if you want to buy, if you want to, you know, um, you know, pay a personnel or consultant that that's working overseas. That can't be covered by by the grant. Or if you want to buy something that's overseas, you have to get approval from the agency. So that's kind of like a overview on the on the budget. Uh, so if we like, uh, if we want to do like contract manufacturing, for example, and the the con the design firm or whatever was mm -hmm. international, would that be a problem? Yeah, that would be a problem just because it's a. It, you know, federal research dollars, they want you to spend the money, uh, money on the project in the U.S. So, yeah, yeah. Um, 
the only you would I would contact the the program officer. So program officer, is, for those of you who may not know, is kind of like a portfolio manager for that particular, um, you know, institute or agency of interest. Um, you know, if the work cannot be performed in the U.S. by any other, um, you know, contract manufacturer, then maybe they would approve it. That they want okay. you to spend the money in the U.S. I see. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. Any other questions? This is great. Okay. Does someone have a question? Okay. No? Okay. Uh, let's go on to slide 11. So um, the next two slides are kind of like my favorite slides. This is a notable. Um, you know, SBR and STTR awardees. Um, so, you know, there's some big companies uh, right now um, who have some um, roots in SBR and STTR funding, um, like, you know, uh, Qualcomm, you know, has you know, received big DOD and NSF grants, you know, uh, back in the day. Um, you know, iRobot, the, the makers of that, uh, you know, some of you might have the, the vacuum robot at home, but they actually do more than um, vacuums. Uh, you know, they, they actually have some uh, military and defense uh, products that were funded um, a lot uh, by uh, SBR and STTR funding. Genzyme, another huge company um, that uh, was acquired by Snofi that uh, got some uh, funding from the NIH. And then uh, finally, if you have a Sonicare toothbrush, you have to thank the SBIR program at the NIH because that early work was funded by them. Um, so if we go to slide 12, um, you know, some other notable SBR and STTR awardees, um, you know, 23andMe, everyone knows about them. Uh, they had multiple NIH SBIR awards. Um, and then uh, with Labs and Semantic, um, you know, they also received um, some nice uh, funding, uh, you know, from, uh, from the SBIR and STTR program. Um, if we go to slide, uh, uh, sorry, uh, slide 13, um, kind of where do we stand uh, as far as the state? Uh, I think we're doing all right. Uh, you know, we're ranked uh, 13th nationally uh, in terms of SBR and STTR funding. And I think we're doing all right because, um, as you may know, a lot of funding is, is, is really on the coast. Um, and, you know, there, there's the states over there, especially like California and Massachusetts, they have high, they're higher ranked in terms of SBR and STTR funding, but we're getting there. Um, you know, I think. Uh, you know, getting, uh, you know, $52 million in, in a few years ago, and that number is only growing, um, you know, that's actually, uh, that's actually pretty good. Um, and not only that, and I'll get to this in a couple of slides, um, funding has increased um, over at the NIH and NSF, um, particularly for the SBR and STTR program. So, you know, there's, there's uh, definitely a chance for us to increase in ranking and definitely a chance for, for you guys to get uh, funding for your startups with even bigger budgets uh, than, than before. Um, so, you know, slide 14, you know, potentially your company could be here. Um, you know, uh, sometimes I, I, no, not sometimes, a lot of the time I get asked by, by companies, you know, how long is this gonna take? I've got things to do, you know, that sort of thing. Um, you know, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to try, you know, raising funding from, from angels, that sort of thing, you know, is, is, is it worth it? And I, and, you know, my, my knee jerk reaction is always is that, yeah, it's definitely worth it. Um, you know, it, this is a tough program um, to get funding from, but getting funding in general is very tough. Um, and, and uh, you know, I'm in the camp of uh, pursuing both types of funding, both non-dilutive and dilutive funding. And if you don't apply, if you don't even try to get a fair and STTR grant, someone else will. So you might as well just, you know, give it a shot. I think there's um, something to be said about even putting pen to paper um, in just kind of strategizing your commercialization uh, path. And, you know, even if you don't get a grant, um, I always say that no grant effort is ever wasted because you can always, you know, take what you wrote down in, in a grant submission, use it for another submission or use it for, um, things like investors or other types of uh, fundraising efforts. So, might as well, you know, try. So, if you go to slide 15, um, the good news about um, this program is that, you know, this funds uh, the development of technology that can, you know, make it to the hospital one day, essentially. Um, 
you know, so, uh, you know, it's early funding for that. Um, I think uh, the second bullet is, uh, um, and the third one is, is huge for a lot of um, startup founders that this is not a loan. You don't have to repay it. Um, you don't have to give up any of your equity, um, you know, to, to the government. Um, and then, you know, also, I think this type of funding um, shines a spotlight on your company and your research. I think when when something is NSF, NIH, or DOD um, stamped, um, that that lends a lot of credibility, uh, research credibility to um, you know the company because these grants are peer reviewed, so you're kind of looked at uh, a little differently. And I see it all the time, um, especially if we have this type of funding. So if we go to slide 16, um, you know, uh, you know, despite um, you know how good the program is, um, you know, there are some challenges with it. In that, you know, over the past several years, um, it has gotten definitely more popular. Um, a lot of startups are trying to chase these type of non-diluted funding dollars, uh, which means it's really competitive. Um, and not only is it very competitive, it can take a long time to get funding. So I have this around seven months because, you know, from the time of application till the time of cash in hand, it can take about seven months to get the cash, so it's, which is a really long time for an early stage startup. Um, also, as far as other challenges, um, you know, you have to put together a credible team for this application. You want to kind of, um, you, you want your, your application to, to stand up from, from the rest. Um, there are hundreds of applications that go in every grant cycle. So, you know, reviewers always look at the team, not only the PI, but those that surround the PI. Can, can this research form the, you know, uh, uh, you know, develop a product that can eventually hit the market. Um, they look at that. Um, as far as the next bullet, uh, another challenge for a lot of researchers is that they have to write this commercialization plan. Um, it's typically a 12-page document. Um, and with NSF, it's 15 pages. But, you know, it's like a business plan. Um, and for some researchers, they're kind of out of their depth here, and they have to look for consultants or other personnel who can write this. So it can be challenging for, for some researchers to develop that because a lot of agencies, um, you know, when you get to the phase two level, they equally weight the research and, and the commercialization plan. Um, and then finally, um, this is the point I really want to stress, is that this government funding that you would get for your startup which means that this funding is subject to scrutiny and audits, um, not only by, um, you know, uh, your accountants, but also the accountants of the federal agencies. So right now, if you, if your company gets $750,000 or more in a, in your company's fiscal years, which is typically a calendar year, um, you are subject to an audit. Um, and, how that works, it's not like there will be people knocking on your business doors with, uh, with suits and suitcases. You actually have to initiate that. You have to let the agency know that, um, you know, you are going to be working with, uh, you know, an accountant and their accountants in order to go uh, through that audit. But, um, and if you don't do the audit, um, you know, uh, federal funds can be suspended. Um, and also you can be, there's a potential to be banned from getting future funding um, through the agency if you don't have the audit performed or if you fail the audit. So that's something um, not to take lightly. I'm going to pause there in case there are any questions. Um, hi, it's, it's Navi again. Um, hi there. Quick, hi, uh, quick question. So if, it, so since it, it takes time to get the funding, um, mm -hmm. if, if we propose something that gets done between the the time we send the application and when we get awarded, is that a problem? So, um, you know, that happens a lot with a lot of companies because it's hard for you to stop your work, right, and wait for this award that you don't even know is coming or not. Um, and, you know, these agencies realize that. Um, what they do allow is something called pre-award spending. So. The NIH and the NSS, in particular, allow pre-award spending at your own risk for up to 90 days. So, if you get an award letter from one of these agencies um, that yeah. you know that says, you know, you start here, you kind of get credit up to 90 days before that start date. So, 
if you have any costs incurred within that period of three months, that's what you can apply towards the grant, not before that time. Okay. Can you yeah. say that one more time? I just I was trying to vision. So oh, sure. 90, yeah, yeah so no days, problem. So you said like 90 days. So let me just, if I understand correctly. So mm -hmm. um, the day you get the acceptance, you have 90 days to that of spending of spending that you can credit to the grant. Is that what what you're saying? Yeah, you can you can move the clock back 90 days. Oh, okay. Essentially, okay. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so if you if your award letter is like it says that you can start the project in January one. Yeah. You can actually count expenses that are directly related to the research um, 90 days before that date. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you can yeah. spend 90 days before the. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And and work with your accountant on that. Um, because, uh, you know, the accountants of the agency will be very particular if you go back in time, which is allowable, but just up to up to 90 days. They call it pre-award spending. Pre-award mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Great. No problem. Any other questions? Great. Doesn't look Great. like it. Okay, super. Um, I'm going to try to go a little quicker because um, I'm just looking at the clock here. Um, but can we go to slide 17, please? Um, so as far as, you know, the eligibility criteria, um, you know, for SBIR and STPRs, um, up, up in bold up top, um, I want to emphasize that at the time of award, um, you, your company has to be, you know, you and your company have to, you know, follow these bullets underneath. And that's just not necessarily at the time of application, um, but, you know, at, at the time of award. So you have to be, you know, for profit. You actually have to be for profit when you apply. Um, so uh, independently owned and operated, the, the business has to be based in the U.S. Um, the next bullet, this is actually really important, company controlled research facilities in the U.S. So um, as I mentioned in a, a few slides back, you have to have space in which you need to work. So it can be lab space, um, you know, office space if you don't require a lab. You know, some companies, you know, just need computers because they're doing, you know, work with algorithm and have simulators, that sort of thing. They don't need wet lab space. Um, you need to have these these research facilities that are company controlled. And by, by that, I mean, you have to have lease and the lease has to be to the company um, at the time of award. You don't necessarily need it at the time of application, although I will say that will help if you do have space, but that doesn't really work for a lot of startups because they don't have money to pay for rent. But the next best thing you can do is that in your application, say that you have identified a space in which the company will work at the time of award and just taking a step further, get a letter of support from that organization that can rent that space to you and be and have that space available for you at the time of award. So that's really important. Um, and then I don't think this is uh, applicable for a lot of people. You have to have less than 500 or fewer employees. Um, and then and then finally, um, with with the with the PI. Um, you know, there's there's a there's an effort, um, you know, requirement that principal investigators, the person who's steering the ship on this project, um, you know, for 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 the NSF, whether it's SBR and STPR, must be primarily employed by the business. And how that's defined is, is that it's uh, you know greater than uh, fifty percent of of a work week. Um, so that person has to be on payroll, um, has to be uh, primarily employed at the, the business at the time of award. Uh, again, for NSF, that's for both SBIRs and STPS, but for NIH, that's just SBIRs. Okay, so if we go to slide can 18. I, can I jump oh, in real quick, Melissa? Uh, sure, so this sure, is, sure, sure. This is Tamira. Um, I just wanted to kind of tag team on to what you said about the, um, the space and the letter of support. And I just sure. wanted to say that HGI does provide a lot of letters of support to accompany um, your application. So, you know, if you're interested and you are looking for space, um, I'd be willing to, to uh, supply that uh, letter. Um, and then, of course, if you're ready, you know, get an award and you're, you're looking for space, and HTI would definitely be a good landing place for you. We also have the incubator lab facility available, too, for um, companies that are, that are ready to take on a more designated space. So, oh, and we do have a question. Hi, it's okay. Navigan. Sorry. Um, so that, no the, problem. 
Uh, back to that question about the work that's done before the start date. Um, mm -hmm. Does that affect uh, how it's reviewed by the how it's how it how that how it's uh, looked at during the peer review process? You know, if if they get the sense that that work will be done before the grant start date, would they be would they be because uh, if we already had a little bit of funding and it's possible that we get that work done before then, would that be a problem in terms of the, the grant being awarded? Um, you know, uh, I think it's a great question. Um, I guess it depends on how you present your grant. If it looks like, um, you know, based, if you present a lot of really good, you know, preliminary data, for instance, um, you know, they might think that, um, you know, you don't, you don't necessarily need that type of funding. Um, but, uh, you know, what you could do in your application, and a lot of companies do have funding going into, um, going into the grant. They might have some angel funding, they may have some, you know, um, they might be bootstrapping, they might be, um, you know, they might even have another SBIR. Um, I think what you, you should really make clear in your application is how you plan to use um, that, you know, the funding from the particular SBIR program that you're applying to. So, you know, you can say that, you know, the company has existing funding that can fund, you know, this part of the project, but we're looking for additional funding from you guys for this other part of the project. So, you know, it's possible, and I mean, in, you know, it's possible for a lot of companies to get funding um, through the SBIR program, even though they have angel or VC money, it's, it's totally fine. You just need to be clear um, how, you know, the current funding that you have is earmarked for other activities and that right. you definitely need money for this project. I see. Okay. Yeah. Can I ask you, this okay. is, uh, got some questions, Brad Merrill. Sure. So um, where would you put that um, in the application? Where would you communicate that? Or, or let's say we want to communicate that yeah. we have, you know, communications with BC and, and there's some help. So yeah, I think that's a great question. I think um, depending on what you're applying for, so if you're doing a phase one grant, um, yeah. you know, for the NIH, for instance, what's that? Yeah, phase one, yeah. Are you, are you targeting NIH or NSF? Yes, NIH. Okay, uh, NIH doesn't give you a lot of room in the research strategy. You limited to six pages. So the place that you can put all this information would be in the facilities page. So I think there's a misconception in the content that goes in the facilities page. People just think that, oh, okay, I put in my lab space, my computers, um, some resources that I have available, but it's, it's more than that through the um, reviewer's eyes. It includes um, any other support that you might have um, if you are part of some industry organizations, if you have funding from other means, if yeah. you have business or clinical advisors, throw that in there. Um, I, I like to use the facilities to kind of just bring out other things going on in the company, which you can't put in the research strategy. Got it. Okay, cool. Thanks. Yeah, you bet. Okay, so let's go to, um, oh yeah, we're on slide 18 already. Okay, so, um, you know, in terms of, um, you know, assessing whether or not this program is right for your company, um, I have in bold here, revolutionary, not evolutionary. So you can't, they, they don't like to fund something that is an incremental improvement on something that already exists. Um, you know, they want, they want to put in this, you know, this, this early, early money for something that um, is kind of like groundbreaking in the field, the research field that, that, you're, that you're in, and something that has a, um, a huge impact, um, you know, in, in society and medical research. Um, you know, the other thing you might be asking yourself is, you know, do I have the right team to complete the project? Um, the most important person on the project is the principal investigator. That person, um, that person's bio sketch, and that has to be included in all these applications, will be looked at very carefully because they want to make sure that that person has the right technical expertise to successfully lead the project. So that person um, does not necessarily have to have a PhD. I will say it helps, but I've worked with others, um, you know, that that have a master's. Uh, I've been a PI in grants. I don't have a PhD. I have a, I have a, a, a master's, but you have to demonstrate that you have successfully led a project. 
uh, research project, whether you've led, um, you know, other grants or, you know, um, have helped bring other, um, you know, uh, projects to the market, you know, the, the PI has looked at very carefully. Also looked at carefully, and I will say this, it's more at the phase two level, is that you have the right business folks to complement your technical expertise. So do you have someone in business development or finance who has experience, um, you know, in, in bringing products and materials to the market? They'll, they'll want to see that, um, you know, especially at the phase two level. Um, you know, some companies, you know, say that they'll hire, you know, these types of individuals, you know, if the grant money comes in. Um, my advice is to, um, you know, I would put down any business or clinical advisors that you have. Um, you know, a lot of these folks either take equity or, or just kind of like defer cash. Um, but you want to show that you're more than one or two people in the team that you actually have, you know, this kind of, you, you have individuals around you to support the business. Um, so, and then, and then finally, um, I think I kind of mentioned this already, the, the technology that's being funded to this grant, um, you know, uh, you know, these federal agencies want to make sure that, you know, this is something that can that can um, grow the economy in terms of jobs, that sort of thing. Okay, so if we go to slide 19, um, I'm gonna go through this really quickly. This is just the three phases, um, slide 19. You know, uh, I, I talked about this. So this is, you know, the SBR program is a three to four year program where you can get money in the different phases. Um, again, you're using other, other people's money. So it's, it's, this is something that you might, you know, wanna consider. If you go to slide 20, um, I, I mentioned this a little earlier in terms of, uh, you know, where where the work needs to be done. They stress this very, like, uh, a lot uh, with the agencies that all R&D must be work performed in, entirely in the U.S. Um, you know, they will have some exceptions, um, but, you know, you need to, you know, bring this to the attention of, of the agency. So if you're doing a clinical trial, for instance, and, you know, there's a certain patient populations that are outside of the U.S., you might be able to use some federal dollars. Um, you know, over there uh, for, for that project. Um, if you have foreign consultants or collaborators on a project, that's allowable, but that work must be performed in the U.S. So they have to be authorized to work, uh, to do this work in the U.S. And then finally, if you're buying any goods or services, um, you know, that's, that's, that's frowned upon through, through the agencies uh, again. So, um, but if there's something that you absolutely cannot buy in the U.S., cannot have performed in the U.S., then you just have to get approval and they might grant that to you. So if you go to slide 21, um, this is just a snapshot of the different agencies that all participate in, in SBR and STPR grants. Um, in slide 22, um, this, um, this is just kind of a snapshot. Um, and I think you all are gonna get these, these slides so I won't go through this in detail, but you know, up, up on top are the different federal agencies um, and they all have different timelines. Um, so these are the, the deadlines, uh, you know, the first are that, you know, for, for SBIRs and STTRs. I will say, though, that there are some agencies like the NIH that may have SBIR grant um, solicitations that are off cycle. So, for instance, I, I know that the NINDS, which is the, um, like the Neurological um, Institute, they have some SBIRs that are due in February, sometimes in June. Um, so I, I would just, you know, go to, um, you know, the agency's website and see and look at, at all their, you know, funding opportunities for SBRs and STTR grants because it can fall sometimes outside of the typical deadline uh, cycles. Um, so, you know, here, you know, when you get a chance, um, you know, this is a snapshot of, you know, different things you, you want to, you know, consider when you're looking at these agencies. Some, some agencies have, most of them just have grants. Some of them have contracts, the real big difference between the two, and um, that has to do with, with the budgeting and reporting requirements with uh, DOD and NASA, for instance, they do contracts and they're very strict on how you spend your money. Um, it, it's, it's difficult to move money around uh, post award uh, compared to NIH and NSF, which, you know, allows some flexibility in moving funding around. You just have to get, you know, um, um, approval, um, you know, from your, your program director. Um, but with the DOD and NASA, it's a little bit difficult to move money around. Okay, so if we go to slide 23, um, this is just kind of um, an explosion of, of, the, of, the, of, of how the, you know, kind of federal agencies, um, 
you know, what their SBR, you know, budgets look like. Uh, DOD has the, the largest budget. Um, I encourage you all um, to, to look at the different solicitations that the DOD has. Um, they're not solely interested in the develop in, in R&D for military uh, related, um, you know, research. Um, you know, for, for instance, you know, I, I worked previously with a, a breast cancer device company. We, we received a DOD contract for the um, advancement of our uh, medical device for, um, you know, uh, patients with breast cancer. So you never know what research areas they might be interested in because um, the DOD is also interested in funding research that can affect uh, not only the military, but their families as well. Um, so then if you go to slide 24, um, I'm just going to quickly just go over DOD because I know most of you are, you know, NIH and NSF, but you never know, you might find some funding over the, at the DOD. Um, so a DOD funding is, is, is has has hard caps, um, you know, phase one is 150,000, um, you know, phase two is $1 million. And again, these are, these are, these are contracts um, that, uh, so, you know, and the DOD might also end up being a customer um, for you at the end of your program. If you go to slide 25, um, you know, more on the DOD, there is um, a number of participating agencies, both with the SBIR and SPPR, each with their own areas of interest. So, um, you know, you know, check them out, DOD, SBIR online and see, you know, what topics and subtopics sub um, may be of interest for your research. So now, um, Let's go to uh, slide 26 on the NIH, which I think is the focus of, of most of you. Okay, so the NIH, they increased their budgets uh, recently, which is fantastic for all of you. Um, previously, the budgets um, were around, the soft cap was 200, oh, uh oh, I think we skipped ahead to 72. So we go to slide 26. Um, Okay, there you go. Um, before it was 225,000. Now that you know the the budgets have increased to some weird number, 252,131. I won't question that since it's a lot higher than previously. Um, but uh, but the budgets increased both at the you know phase one level as well as the phase two level. Um, you know uh, approval rates for phase one around 15 to 16 percent, um, but at the phase two level, um, you know that 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 jumped. Um, you know, um, just because, you know, the, the company is a little bit ma more mature when they reach, you know, phase two, um, you know, they're a different position. They can write, you know, uh, typically, you know, better commercialization plans have successfully completed, uh, you know, their phase one. Otherwise, they couldn't apply to phase two. Um, and so they can, the success rate jumps up a little bit higher. Um, I do want to draw your attention to that third row with respect to one of the big differences um, between SBR and SPPR. So in both instances, um, you know, you can subcontract to an academic partner like UIC, um, but, there are, but there are some requirements. So for SPPR, uh, you're required to subcontract 30% of your budget. So that's, so they say 30% of the effort, but that's really 30% of your budget has to go to the university for an SPPR. Uh, for an STTR, um, so at least 30, but no greater than 60 percent, because if it's greater than 60 percent, then it's no longer really a, a research project for for uh, the company. It's a university project. Um, if we go look at you know SBIR, you can definitely uh, subcontract, um, but they typically for phase one they don't want a third of the no greater than a third of the budget. Um, to go to um, the, the subcontracting research institution, and for phase two, that jumps up um, to, you know, no greater than 50%. I will say, though, at the phase two level, um, you know, in my experience, that if you wanted to go greater than 50% at phase two, because you're, you might be at a stage where you're outsourcing more, um, there there may be some flexibility to increase that. So if you're working with, you know, contract manufacturers, um, you know, yeah, CROs, you might want a higher budget um, for that, and, and that would be reviewed on a case-by-case, -case, um, you know, basis. But, you know, these are just kind of like, um, you know, the, the budget restrictions between, between the two. 
Um, as far as the principal investigator for SBIR, as mentioned previously, uh, the PI has to be 50% employed uh, by the company, and at SCPR, uh, the PI can be employed either at um, the research institution or the company, but there is an effort requirement where there's a 10% effort required for that PI. There's probably going to be some questions, so I'm going to pause right now uh, if anyone has questions about um, this slide or any slides leading up to it. Um, hi, hi, it's Navid again. Um, hi. So, yeah, hi. So, I'm, I'm looking back on uh, slide 20. So, it says foreign consultants and collaborators are allowable but must be, must perform consulting in the U.S. Could you elaborate on that? Yeah, so that the um, that individual must be authorized to work in the U.S. Okay. Um, so, but that work has to be performed in the U.S. Uh huh. Yeah. I see. So okay. Yeah. So if they're like, so the the office that they work out has to be in the U.S. Basically. Yeah, yeah, okay. and you know that sort of thing um, may be reviewed in an audit. Um, I know some audits that, you know, I've been through, they not only look at, you know, employee contracts, they look at consulting, you know, engagement contracts too. So uh -huh. that can be that can be looked at um, carefully. I see. So if, if if we don't if we don't apportion any part of our budget towards working with a with the overseas um, consultant, that that's not gonna be, that shouldn't be a problem as long as that the other money that we might have accumulated other ways is sent to that, and we use the rest of the SBR money specifically for U.S. Yeah. State. Okay, and that's not going to yeah, be a, yeah. an issue at all, or something to be frowned upon in any way. No, as long as you, as long as the federal dollars are spent in the U.S., you know that's uh -huh. what they're really concerned about. But if you have other, you know, funding, whether it's private funding, whatever, and, and you want to pay your consultant who's overseas to do the project, that's that's fine. That needs to be clear, though, that you okay. know, private funding is is used for that effort. Okay. Uh, I have yeah. a question, Kathy Phillips, Chargis Bell. Um, sure. If the coronavirus and the new edicts put out by the, by the president last night might dramatically affect this. Um, correct, because they, we now have 30 day suspension between here and Europe, um, except for Britain. Yeah. So it might be yeah. that in the interest of complying with those executive orders, uh, there might be waivers granted, do you think, to this? In other words, if you had a 10% or you know, contract with somebody in France and they can't get here on a routine basis because of the yeah. coronavirus, would yeah. they? You could go to your your officer at at the NIH or whatever your program project person and say you know yeah. this guy's going to do the work but um, he really can't come but he could easily yeah. do the work there as well as here it's virtual whatever the work he's doing yeah potentially um, you know I know with the with the NSF and NIH they've moved a lot of their their conferences and workshops so you know all virtual so you know they're they're virtual so I think you know. Um, there may, I don't want to speak on their behalf, but, you know, there may be some flexibility that would, you know, allow for that situation you just described. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Just was curious because, you know, that we have a couple of people who will look at data and they could do it here or they could yeah. do it. But if there's some kind of travel thing going on, you know, one, we don't yeah. know. <laughs> and, you know, and two, right. uh, they probably wouldn't be yeah. able to come. Yeah, okay. All right. Exactly, exactly. I think I think that the you know, as long as they're authorized, like they they could if they they would if they could, right? Um and I, I think that would probably be allowable. Um but again you'd have to talk with your program officer about that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. You bet. Okay. Um let's go to slide twenty seven. Um, unless there are any other questions, I just have a, a lot more slides to just kind of flip through. Um, so if I, this is just kind of a snapshot of just the, the success rate, depending on the type of grant you apply for, uh, whether it's phase one, phase two, um, there's also direct to phase two mechanism, which I'll get to a little later, where you bypass phase one, or a fast track mechanism where you apply for phase one and phase two at the same time. 
And then far on the right, COP is a commercialization readiness program that's um, for phase two awardees, and those just kind of the success right there. If you go to slide 28, um, this is a, a snapshot of all the different institutes that are that are within the NIH, and there, there's a lot of different institutes. You know, some institutes have just grants, some have grants and contracts, um, like the NCI, um, but, you know, each has their own research in, interests. Um, so, um, you know, I encourage you to just kind of, um, you know, look at the, the different institutes to see where, you know, technology may have a fit. Um, if you have a platform technology, you can certainly apply to, you know, multiple uh, institutes, um, you know, to, you know, kind of advance the platform. To do this by 29, another uh, great thing about the NIH is that they have these programs um, that help, uh, you know, companies along the way in between, you know, phase one and phase two, for instance, there's a uh, um, a niche assessment program that's more of a, like kind of like a marketing type of program they have available for awardees. Um, the commercialization assistance program between phase two and phase three, which is, is sometimes, uh, you know, a period of where there's kind of like a valley of death for companies where they have, you know, technology that, that's moving right along, but they're just not quite ready, uh, you know, for the market. So there's, you know, commercialization assistance programs as well as, um, you know, phase two um, you know, phase two, phase two B programs that, that can help, uh, you know, bring your, uh, you know, project, your, your product to the market. Um, in slide three, uh, I want to talk about fast track grants for a little bit. Um, this is a little, this is interesting for, um, you know, a lot of companies just because, um, essentially with, with the fast track, uh, grant, you submit both your phase one and phase two application at the same time. And the reason why, companies like to do this is because there's no stop, essentially no stop in the flowing of funds. Um, you know, you do have to submit a, you know, phase one report and that has to get approved before, you know, phase two, uh, if phase two fund access. But, um, you know, traditionally you, you have to wait, you know, a whole grant cycle if you want, you, you, you know, submit a phase one and then get awarded, then you apply for phase two. There's a, like a whole grant cycle, whereas in the fast track, um, that the money just continues as long as you um, have completed and uh, got your phase one report uh, approved. So if you go to slide 31, um, you know, here's some things that you may not know about the NIH. Um, you can switch between an SBR to an SCPR and vice versa um, from phase one to phase two. You know, for instance, if you, were, if you applied with an S and got funding for an SCPR for phase one, um, and you were really reliant on the university, had a PI over there, but then, you know, um, got some more funding along the way, you know, the company changed, you can apply um, for phase two. Um, you can switch to phase two um, and vice versa. For uh, the other uh, program that's available through the NIH is, is direct to phase two, where you bypass phase one if you have, um, you know, have demonstrated feasibility, um, you know, already. Um, you have to present that data, um, you know, to, in, in your uh, grant application, uh, but not every institute allows for this mechanism with an NIH, so you might want to, you know, see if your institute does. And then finally, uh, phase 2B, this is a, a bridge to commercialization program um, that is uh, at particular institutes, um, like um, the NCI, the NIDDK, um, you know, they have phase 2B programs that can fund up to $3 million for the three years. And typically um, that's for, um, to support any regulatory efforts uh, for funding um, pivotal trials typically, um, but that, that program is available. Um, any questions uh, uh, so far or since the last time we had a pause? Yeah, I have a question. This is Stephen Ackerman. Um, in, in, in your phase one application, is it important mm -hmm. and do reviewers want to see how you might propose to transition from the phase one into the phase two? Um, yeah. Is that something you need to cover mm -hmm. within the application? Yeah, uh, you do, uh, but I wouldn't do it in so much detail because with phase one, you only have six pages and usually I put um, uh, a section, a small section, um, you know, a short paragraph on plans for phase two. Um, so, 
so that's that is your opportunity to you know put in what you plan to do whether you're um, you know, adding new features, adding and testing new features, or if you're moving into a larger animal model, or if you're moving into clinical, that sort of thing. So I would put that in a paragraph, um, you know, at, at the end of your phase one application. Great. Research strategy, the research strategy. Yeah, sure. Great. Anything else? Anyone else? Okay. So let's um, go to slide 32. Um, you know, one thing I really want to stress is that, you know, these grants are submitted electronically. Um, for those of you who have been fortunate to get NIH or NSF grants um, as an academic through your research institution, um, you typically have someone at the university submitting the application, but as a small business applicant, it is now your job to do all of that or, you know, have someone in your company do all of that. The, the university um, it is outside of their um, their job to submit an application for you. Um, so there are certain registrations that need to be completed um, prior to the submission of um, the application. Um, if they're not completed, you won't be able to submit. Um, I usually tell companies to allow yourself anywhere between six to eight weeks um, for um, you know these registrations to be completed. The one that is going to give you the most problems if you haven't done these registrations is the SAM, the System for Award Management, because that is the one that takes the longest um, to get uh, approved. So uh, you want to make sure that you get these completed um, in a timely manner. So if you go to slide uh, 33, um, you know, continuing on the fact that this is electronically submitted, again, the company has to do it, and it's either done, uh, you know, through the assist um, you know, website or through grants.gov. And there are webinars that the NIH has, um, recorded uh, videos rather, um, on you know, how to submit the application. So um, just moving right along here because there's a number of slides to continue on, but uh, going to slide 34, um, I want to talk about the NSF, um, the National Science Foundation. Um, you know, as a, a, a you know a big budget actually, it's greater than seven and a half billion now. Um, but you know, they they fund about uh, 400 SBIR and SCTR companies a year. Uh, it might be even more now um, since their since their budgets increased. Um, and if you go to slide 35, um, we can see that you know just kind of how their budgets increase. And this is very recently, um, especially for phase two. That's very recent. I think it's like last month. Um, where they, they moved it from 750,000 to a million dollars. So um, the, uh, you know, this is a, the new funding ceilings. Uh, you cannot, unlike the NIH, you, these, are, um, these are budget caps. So you cannot exceed, um, you know, these dollar amounts. Um, but like the NIH, the NSF also has a phase 2B um, mechanism. But with the NSF, they require matching revenue uh, for, for investment. So, um, you know, if, you, if they can fund up to 500,000, but you need to have, um, you know, uh, like matching revenue or investment uh, to support that. So if we go to slide 36, um, here are some, you know, some stats on, uh, on, on the NSF program in, in slide 36. There you go. Okay, so I think some interesting things to note here is that, um, you know, the vast majority of the companies are small, so 10 or fewer employees. Um, you know, also the majority of these awardees have, you know, never received, um, you know, a phase two award from any agency. Um, these companies, um, they're very young. Um, you know, a lot of them are, um, you know, just, uh, you know, un under five years old, uh, many just a year or, or two years old, um, and a lot of them have just have just been formed. So the NSF is 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 very friendly um, to to early companies because they realize that you know they're often the first dollar in uh, for these companies. If we go to slide 37, um, we have here, here's just kind of like a, a snapshot of you know some. The funding rates uh, of the success rates. So, um, you know, at a phase, a phase one level, um, you know, there's a 16% funding rate at, at phase two, like the NIH, it jumps to 39. Um, and then 
you know, another a nice program stat for the NSF is that, you know, there's a handful of companies that get acquired, so they exit um, every year. So, so that's, uh, that's, that's nice. And then also in the last point, um, uh, you know, half, around half of the phase two awardees are able to raise a lot of third party funding. So angel or VC funding um, to help um, accelerate their commercialization efforts. So if we go to slide 38, okay, um, you know, the, the NSF, like the NH, only likes to, you know, only funds um, R&D. Um, NSF is, you know, very particular on uh, funding, you know, novel uh, research, whether it's towards a product, process, or service, and they provide those early dollars that, for technologies that um, are, are high risk, as well as, um, game changing in your area of uh, research. Um, so, you know, that's kind of what they like to fund. Um, if we go to slide 39, um, these are things that the NSF does not fund, like the NIH, they do not fund, you know, basic research. They don't fund, um, you know, incremental improvements to existing, um, existing uh, products or services. Um, the NSF is also, um, they're stricter in terms of assessing um, the commercial potential of a company. Um, I, I've noticed over the, the past few years that the reviewers, um, you know, while most have technical backgrounds, um, they do put in um, CEOs, business development people from startups who are funded, um, you know, through them in the review panel. So there's a strong emphasis um, on, you know, just the commercial aspect of the business. Um, so they want to make sure that the dollars that they're putting in have a, have a you know, um, have a big impact um, on the company and, and the economy um, in, in the future. Um, also, NSF does not fund analytical or market studies for stuff that already exists because, you know, they don't consider that uh, research. So if we go to slide 40, here is a, a snapshot of all the different technology topic areas that the NSF, um, you know, likes to likes to fund. Um, so if you don't see, um, you know, a topic area where your technology might, you know, fit in, I, you know, they encourage you to reach out to them because you might fall into the other topics area. So that's on the on the right side. Um, I will say for those that are, um, you know, developing drugs, um, the NSF does not. Uh, does not typically fund traditional drug development. Um, they do fund drug delivery um, processes or, or, or um, like, a, yeah, just processes related to that, that enable drug development, but traditional drug development, um, they do not fund. Um, they also do not fund traditional clinical trials. Um, they, they will fund some early feasibility um, human studies. They refrain from using clinical trials because they don't, they say that's more for NIH, but they, you know, they will fund, they may fund rather, you know, small um, feasibility studies, uh, but that's something that you would have to discuss with the program director over there. So any questions before I uh, go to the next slide? We've got two questions here. Okay, go for it. Um, this is Mike Johnson. Um, going back to slide 32, the number of things that you have to do for registration, are those yes. sequential or can they be done in parallel? Yeah, sure, sure. Um, for some things you can, you can do in, in parallel, um, but, uh, you know, for for SAM.gov, for instance, you need to have, you know, your tax ID, um, mm -hmm. the company needs to be formed, that sort of thing. Um, but if you go to the, um, if you're applying for NIH grant, uh, NSF also, um, they have kind of like, um, you know, their list of, um, you know, the registrations that you need to complete. But um, I will say for SAM.gov, which, which I noted earlier, it takes the longest to, to get. Um, you know, they'll let you know uh, what's lacking before you can even um, complete the registration. So, yeah. So basically, some of them you take, uh, 
to yeah, make basically sure. going and look at it. Okay. Yeah, Dunn's number definitely is first. You can't do you can't do um, any of these without uh, the Dunn's number because the company needs to exist. Um, you know, uh, Sam.gov. You know, you don't need um, you know ERA Commons, but you need um, you know SBR company registry. But if you go to that, you know, the NIH, uh, you know, SBR website, and it will let you know exactly um, what you need to do first. Okay. Uh, hi, it's Navi again. Um, quick question on the, uh, so NSF versus NIH. Um, it seems like mm -hmm. NS NSF has, like, some biomedical um, categories. Um, if you're somewhere, if you're, if you're, Somewhere in that range, uh, somewhere in that topic area. What, uh, what's your feeling on ch choosing NSF versus NIH? Um, you know, um, I think it. What, what's great about um, uh, the NSF and NIH is that you can actually apply for both. They have different. Okay. Uh, they have different. Uh, uh, you know, um, cycles, grant cycles. So. Um, you know, the, the NIH is um, January, April, September, and then NSF is now. They have four, uh, four submission windows basically after each quarter. So, um, you know, you can potentially apply for both. You can apply for both you, the same project, um, if applicable, uh, to both agencies. However, if you're fortunate to, um, you know, do well in both, you can only accept funding for one. From yeah. one, um, but you can apply uh, for you know to both agencies and many companies do um, for different projects mm -hmm. and receive funding from both. Um, you know, I, I know a lot of companies that just apply for both, and they may get their and they might ha they may submit their NIH grant and they take that and they want to increase your chances for funding and then they you know. Uh, you know, adjust the you know application requirements because you know research strategy for a phase one application on age is six pages, for instance. But the project description is 15 pages in the NSF, so they just they essentially recycle the grant. Um, but you know they adjust the format. Um, you know, I I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily pit uh, the two of them uh, against each other. Um, but if there is a possibility that you can apply for both, I, I would definitely do that. So, okay, so when it says, like, uh, submission windows, uh, it's anywhere between that, inside that window, so, like, from March 6th to June 4th, for instance. Mm hmm Okay, just to clarify. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay. And, um, okay, and then do you, do you also recommend contacting their, uh, like, program officers as well? In addition yeah, to yeah. Yeah, um, what's different, and it's actually going to be on, on the next slide, on slide 41, is that there's a required project pitch, which is like a pre-proposal at the NSF, okay. um, where that you need to get an, you need to get an invite to apply. Um, so maybe we can, are, are there any other questions? If not, then, then I can go into the project pitch, which is applicable to your question. Okay, thank you. You bet. Any other questions? <clears throat> okay, so no, let's go good. to slide 40. Oh, okay, great. So let's go to slide 41. So the required project pitch is just for NSF, so not NIH. Um, it's essentially, there, you're essentially um, providing an executive summary of, of what, you're, what you're planning to do. There's, there's five questions and it's required. So, um, unlike the NIH, the NSF, you need to get invited to apply. So, you know, it's, it's a pretty straightforward, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, effort where, you know, you just have to answer these, you know, five questions. You know, there's, there's word limits um, for each of these things. And then within three weeks, you get an outcome. Um, you either get an invite to submit a full, full proposal or, you know, uh, you know, you get, um, you know, you get told to, you know, try again. Uh, you know, uh, next cycle, um, but they'll tell you why. Um, there is uh, some benefit in talking with a program director um, before you submit the project pitch, um, because if you are 
declined. Um, an invite, you can't submit another one for the current window. You have to wait until the next window. Um, so, um, you know, I would, you know, first of all, read on, you know, what areas of interest uh, fall within each technology topic area. And then, you know, reach out to the program director. I will say that, you know, in some of the program directors that I or some companies I work with have talked to, you know, they say, oh, just submit their project pitch, you know, but, you know, um, some though will say, oh, you might want to focus on X, Y, and Z on, on the project pitch. But I guess what I'm saying is like, if, if you're unsure, if you're a fit and don't want, um, you know, you want to put your best foot forward in submitting the project pitch, reach out to the program director to see if it's, um, if your project um, is appropriate for the NSF. So, um, I guess the outcome is usually three weeks, but uh, some companies know in a couple of days. Uh, I know one company that knew in a day, and that doesn't, that doesn't mean that they're really, really interested in um, your, in your project. It's just that, you know, um, there was bandwidth within that technology topic area. So um, as long as you get an invite, then you're fine. So if you go to slide 42, um, some important notes here. Um, for, for the NSS, the principal investigator uh, must be employed by the small business at the time of award. So that's for both SBRs and FTTRs. And I realize that this is thing to be restrictive um, for some founders that um, are employed by the university, but um, you know, one thing that you can do for an NSS is have a, a co-PI and submit an STPR. So you would have um, you know, someone employed at the university as the co-PI, but the main PI uh, would still have to be um, employed by the company at the time of award. Um, also, the PI must have uh, must commit uh, one at least one calendar month. Um, on that uh, phase one project. And in terms of uh, how primary employment is defined, that's, um, you know, it's defined as 51% uh, employed uh, by the small business concern at the time of award. So essentially greater than 19.6 uh, hours in a given work week. So if we go to slide 43, um, hopefully by, by now, but you know, uh, a little around an hour, half in, um, you know, maybe I've um, got you interested in, or just more intrigued about the program. Um, but I will say that this applying uh, for these grants is a journey. Um, you know, it's uh, it, putting them together is not is not easy. Um, you know, waiting for the feedback is not easy. Um, getting a rejection sometimes the first time around is not easy either. Um, but, you know, I, I just want to say don't feel discouraged, um, and I know some researchers do, um, you know, if you don't get funded the first time around, sometimes it takes two tries, sometimes it takes three tries, but, you know, once, once you're in, um, it then becomes a lot easier to get not only funding from the agency that you receive funding from, but from other agencies too. So let's go to slide uh, 44. Um, I kind of want to go over some frequently asked questions. Um, you know, I often get asked, like, how long will it take me to write this grant? You know, I always say, you know, two to three months is, is it, you know, pretty safe. Um, you know, some companies uh, need more time. Some companies need less time because they have a lot of the material already. Um, I also get asked, you know, can I just work out of my house? It can't that be my place of business? Um, so, you know, the NH and NSF and other federal agencies don't want that. They actually want you to rent space um, as a place of business so it cannot be your home. Um, I also get asked, um, can, you know, instead of renting lab space, can my company just work in my PI's lab? There's an open bench, we can set up shop over there. Um, so that's a no. Um, again, you have to have, you know, company controlled space. You can subcontract to the university and work on that bench, uh, but that 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 would be um, under the uh, the subcontract budget. Um, I also get asked when the grant money comes in. Sometimes it's six to seven months, um, maybe longer if you're trying to do a clinical trial, and you know the agency wants you to have IRD approval. Um, I answered the last the the next one on the on the PhD part. So 
um, you know, you just have to, the PA needs to demonstrate um, that they are, you know, have the right technical expertise and have demonstrated that they have successfully led projects in the past to be a strong PI. Um, and then the last question is on preliminary data. I get that asked all the time. So prelim data is not required for the application, but it helps. Uh, if you're up against a couple hundred applications um, and, you know, companies have, you know, strong preliminary data, um, you know, that they might have an edge over what you're proposing. So while not required, um, it certainly helps. So if we go to slide 45, um, here are some of my, you know, grant application tips. Those registrations start those early. Don't wait to, you know, the last minute because it won't happen. Um, even if you call the help desk, you know, uh, it, the chances for that are, are slim. So you have to start your registrations early. Um, also, uh, have conversations, early conversations with your program officer, um, you know, earlier on, um, just to see if you're, you're a fit, um, fit for that uh, technology. Um, actually, I'm, I'm going to go through these points individually. So let's go to slide 46 really quick. So this is just a snapshot of the different um, registrations that you have to complete prior to submission. Like I said, allow yourself uh, four to six weeks to complete it. So go to slide 47. Um, this is, uh, you know, kind of, you know, reaching out um, to get to your program officer to get some pre-application guidance. It's, it's not required. It's, it's, I just highly suggest it um, just so, you know, um, so that, you know, you don't want to waste your time in putting together this um, you know, behemoth of an application only to know that it wasn't a fit in the first place. So, you know, reach out and, you know, reaching out includes, um, you know, sending an email to the program officer, send over, you know, whether you have an executive summary of the company, you know, um, you know, some, some um, like a brief description of the aims you want to propose, but be focused, um, you know, on your ask because you'll probably only get about you know, 20 minutes, if not, of, of, um, of their time to, to kind of go over this. Um, I, I will say, though, and I just want to go to the, the last bullet, uh, the don't be annoying. I know this is kind of weird, um, but I do know uh, one company um, that did not get their phase two grant because they called and emailed the, um, you know, program officer too much. Um, uh, asking them when uh, when funding would come in, um, and the program director felt uh, did not feel confident with the company in in terms of um, you know uh, them raising some outside funding, or they felt that they were too reliant on the NSF of funding, so they did not get funded. And you know that's just I guess that's just some advice: just don't overdo it on the communication uh, because. There are hundreds of other companies contacting them too, and that's not the lasting impression that you want to make. So if you go to slide 48, um, in, in assembling your team. I'm I so, sorry, I have a quick question on that point. Sure. Um, uh, so yeah, we've been trying to contact a couple program officers to get you know feedback, and um, yeah, and it's been we've been waiting of uh, you know about a week, and it's getting close to the deadline. So is that so uh, we've been following up on, you know, saying them follow up, follow up emails that like maybe every other day or every two days is that being annoying? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, you know, not necessarily. Um, so I think it's because, are you going for the NIH deadline next month? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's because this is just a really busy time for them. Okay. Um, you know, it's, it's difficult. It's not that they're purposely ignoring you. It's just, um, you know, not only are is there an upcoming grant deadline, but they may also be reviewing their already submitted grants. There may be a council meeting, that sort of thing. So it's a, when you approach um, kind of like the next deadline, that period, it gets particularly busy. Um, so just don't take it personally. Okay. And do you also think that because yeah. of, you know, the virus going on and them probably transferring to remote work and all that stuff can also be delaying some of the response time too? Yeah, potentially, potentially. I, I know that NSF has, has definitely gone all, um, you know, virtual. I wouldn't be surprised if, if the NIH too. So, you know, there might, there might be delays in that, um, 
you know, because of a lot of transition of all those activities, certainly. Any other questions? Yeah, this this is Steve Ackerman. I have a maybe I could wait till you finish the details of that prior slide, but um, what's your experience with um, interacting with companies that are um, focused on um, writing uh, and consulting on the writing of SBI RSTTR grants? Um, we've had just had a visit with, at, by one group at, at the OTM and we met with them and um, they actually mm -hmm. do the whole thing soup to nuts um, even the first draft of the application and all the registrations and all these things. Of course, they charge, you know, fees like a lot. Like, yeah. yeah. Like 5,000 for a, in yeah. phase one. And then there's a success fee of 15% after that. What, yes. Yeah. What's your yeah. experience with doing that? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I do know some companies that have um, outsourced, uh, you know, grant writing. Um, some just do grant consulting. So, I mean, there's a, there's a big difference, right? So grant writing is like, you know, they have the pen, they'll, you know, put it together. They'll get information from you, that sort of thing. And then there's grant consultants who are more on, on the review side. Um, you know, I will say that you know your technology best. You know your company best to completely outsource it, that's a lot of risk. And that's just my personal view. Um, I, I'm more on the camp of, you know, being more of a shared effort because, you know, they, if you're completely outsourcing it to a group, you're likely not their only client. So I, I question then, you know, their bandwidth um, and then also how fast they can get up to speed on the intricacies of your technology. So if there's any way, and, um, you know, I, I do understand and realize the appeal of outsourcing the effort, if there's a way to share that effort, that would be my recommendation. Um, because to just hand it off completely to, uh, to a group and wait for the deliverable, there's just a, to me, there's just a lot of risk in that. Um, but I would just share that effort. Yeah, I mean, I have, a, I have experience from a number of years ago with a commercial partner, and they hired a mm -hmm. consulting company for this purpose who claimed they had an 85% success rate on phase one applications. And mm -hmm. uh, they had their process included inserting a lot of hyperbole about, you know, how great our idea was, and it was, you know, better than sliced bread, et cetera, et cetera. And they kind of overstated yeah. a lot of information. And when the reviewers got it, who were experts yeah. in the field, they were really angry with it. And we didn't do very well on the first application sure. and that was a real problem and so i guess you know um i presume that not overstating how good your uh, ip is is something that you want to be careful of yeah yeah definitely overstating how good your ip is or overstating how good your technology is without without proof without references um you know, uh, is, is, is not good. So, you know, again, I think, um, you know, I, I don't discourage, you know, working with outside group. I, I think it's really helpful and a lot of companies do, um, but, you know, they only work with what they're given. So, um, you know, they need a, a lot of information on the front end and, you know, to make it, uh, you know, a successful endeavor, then I would, you know, make it, you know, a really true back and forth process. Okay, great. Um, I'm gonna, uh, I'm just gonna zip through the rest of the slides as fast as I can. I know that we have like 20 or so uh, minutes here. Um, but if we, if we go to, you know, slide 48, um, you know, I, I, I've been stressing kind of throughout um, the, the talk here on assembling a team and yeah. So, uh, you know, the PI is, is again, is, is the most important person on the team, make sure that, you know, they have a, you know, a, a good, um, you know, uh, suitable background um, for your research um, that, you know, it makes sense for them to be on on the project and not just be a body on the project because um, they have, um, you know, uh, you know, prior research that research has to be applicable in the field. Um, if you go to slide 49, um, you know, speaking of, of patents, um, you know, 
uh, it's not a requirement to to have you know um, you know filed IP, but uh, you know reviewers look for your IP strategy. So you don't have to have issued IP, for instance, but they want to make sure that you thought through the strategy for not only developing but also maybe optioning, um, you know, the IP uh, from your tech transfer office. But if you completely do not have at least a paragraph on, on an IP, that's, that's a red flag to them. So write something about your IP strategy, whether you're, you know, you have plans to option, license, and or have plans to develop your own company controlled IP. Put that in your application. Um, you know, slide 50, um, you know, this, this kind of seems like it's obvious. Um, here yeah, I'm in sorry, slide. we have a question here in the room. Sorry to interrupt. Oh, sure, no problem. Um, on, on the IP uh, and filing the provisional, I think it's really important. Uh, I actually knew a company that really got burned badly because they were funded for phase one. They published the abstract and it made it not obvious. Mm. So, um, but you must remember that it's a year to date from the time you file it that you must actually file, um, you must go from a provisional actually to a regular patent filing. And yeah. make, sure, yeah. make sure you don't slap a, a cover sheet on it uh, and make a provisional out of an invention disclosure go ahead and write claims because any claims you write after that are not included in the priority date. And I, I, I know that from personal experience. So, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so um, it wasn't filed by me but my institution. So it's really mm -hmm. important to make sure that what you file is defendable in terms of your, your priority date. And that's just, you know, IP, you know, 101, but it isn't obvious to everybody at a university. Um, so. Sure, sure, sure. That was my only um, because yeah. I've seen people get burned. Yeah, no, I, I believe you. Um, yeah, I think it is important, like um, you know, just having these these things properly in place. So, um, you know, uh, work the tech transfer office. Have your the company should have their own counsel too, uh, not just solely rely on, on the university because uh, with, the, with the university they're protecting the university, not necessarily you know the the company. Um, so. Um, you know, companies should have their own own counsel as well to help with that. Um, so if we go to slide 50, um, you know, this seems kind of obvious, but you know, you, I think it's important um, to focus on achievable goals. Don't have an overly ambitious um, proposal where that work that you're proposing, um, you know, would take longer than the time uh, you're proposing. So, you know, for instance, if you're doing a phase one. Um, it would be questionable if you had like a like a large clinical trial, um, you know, um, it, it, you know that I think you know some of these projects, you know, this is a peer reviewed effort, so you know they might call your bluff um, on on some on some aims that may be too long to complete in the time you're proposing, or they might be you know to um, you know something that they think that can't be um, achieved at all in, in the project. So run it by your peers would be my advice. So if you go to slide 51, um, this also seems kind of uh, obvious too, but I've known a couple companies that, um, you know, that have made, that made, uh, you know, uh, typographical errors or, you know, had, had sections of the application missing, which completely tanked their application. Um, so pass it along to, you know, a colleague that you trust. Um, you know, to, to review it because um, you might just be missing something or have like a, like a, you know, um, an error that can, um, you know, uh, uh, have your application poorly reviewed. So if you go to slide 40, 52, sorry, um, this is just kind of like a, a laundry list here um, of, of why applications, um, why grant proposals don't get funded. Um, you know, uh, a lot of it has to do with, um, you know, uh, uh, lack of uh, of something that is kind of like groundbreaking in the field. So again, I, and I stress this a number of times that they want to fund, you know, revolutionary science, something that um, is is groundbreaking. Um, you know, they the on that on the business side, um, you know, they they also will look at things whether or not this has commercial legs. If this has um, you know something that has a strong chance of making it to the market. Um, you know, other things that they that they look at, um, 
which it attacks a lot, um, has to do with uh, the approach section of your research strategy. That is looked at very carefully. And again, these are uh, these grants are reviewed by your peers. So if they, you know, they may have issues in um, just your rationale for, you know, the AMD approach or uh, your approach to some of the, you know, um, experimental design. So that's that's a big reason why, um, you know, uh, grants don't get, um, you know, considered. Um, you know, and I think also, you know, what's not on this list too, depending on the institute or funding agency that you go for, they just might not have enough budget. Um, so, you know, you might not just score within a certain, um, you know, pay line range um, that is not necessarily, not that your grant was, was, was bad, it's just there isn't enough funding um, for your particular application. So if you go to slide uh, 53, um, here's just, you know, uh, just a list of, um, you know, sites you might want to look at. Again, you'll get these, um, you know, you get these slides uh, uh, later. Uh, slide 54, um, sbir.gov um, is pretty resourceful. They have a lot of uh, videos too on just how to do, um, you know, things like just putting together the application. Um, slide 55, if you are active in social media, so are the NH, so is the NH NSF too. Um, you know, they, uh, um, you know, when they have workshops, which are probably not virtual, um, you know, they, they, they treat activity. Um, in slide 56, um, IUIN is obviously a, a great resource too, um, not only, you know, for um, SBR and SCSR consulting, but for your other business needs. Um, if we go to, you know, slide 57, um, this is, I was just going to take kind of like a, a deeper dive into some things, but I realized that we're, we're uh, you know, tight on time, so I can quickly go through them um, and maybe, uh, maybe I'll just I'll pause right now if there's, there's any questions. Hi, uh, quick question on prelim like preliminary data. Um, yeah. So what's what's you know what's a good you know what's a good balance in terms of showing preliminary data? Um, as, yeah. I, mean, I think as long as I, I imagine as long as you're proposing stuff that you haven't done yet, you're in good shape. But if we show if we show that we're very capable with preliminary data, does that hurt us? No. Um, you know, I know a lot of, um, you know, companies, they have, you know, published work already, um, mm -hmm. you know, in, in key journals. Does that hurt? No, it helps because um, it, it shows that um, that you have some, you have a strong foundation um, and that you're looking to um, NIH or NSF to further t the technology to take it to the, you know, the next step, with it, whether it's a different model or, you know, whatever. Um, I, I think I think that certainly helps. Um, so, you know, again, I, I encourage you, you putting in uh, preliminary data and stating specifically why that preliminary data um, is kind of like, uh, kind of like the groundwork for, um, you know, your, your application. And, right. Um, yeah. Oh, thank you. Okay. Sure. Anything else before we kind of go into things like timelines and budgets? Okay, um, yeah, if we go to slide 58, oh, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I get this preliminary data. I, I went to one, uh, one of the, uh, another SBIR seminar, and there's, there's a series of people who kept talking about their experiences about preliminary data, and I went down, mm -hmm. uh, several years ago, I went to an NSF guy, and he said, preliminary data is, you know, you're too late in your technology to say this. And then, you know, too much preliminary data. And then I had somebody else in another thing when, you, when we talked a little bit, they said, oh, well, you know, that preliminary data is nice, but it's not important. And then you don't want too much. So you don't want too much, but you don't want too little. If you have right. it in a, in a different system, let's say in, in my situation, where we're, we have in vitro, in vivo data in an animal, but we want to develop a, a binding assay uh, that relies on understanding the mechanism for that as a predictor of the success of the therapy in people. So we don't have any binding data in vivo, in vitro now, you know, in, 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 in an assay, yes. 
but we only have the, mm -hmm. the animal data. Is that the kind of preliminary data one would like? That is, in a system you think, I, I think I have the data that indicates that this is the mechanism by which this cell binds to that thing. And yet now, now I want to develop a binding assay that you could commercialize that might predict success in that mm -hmm. binding in vivo, right? Is yeah. that too yeah. much data or is that the right kind of data? I don't think that's too much. I think as long, I, I will say, you know, generally as long as your preliminary data provides the um, evidence and rationale for your aims proposed, that's good enough. That um, because I've seen some reviews where um, you know reviewers you know question the aims or objectives, they felt like it came out of nowhere. As long as you just lay out um, you know that, that that preliminary data is the rationale for the next step of your technology, um, that's fine. And I, I've seen you know you know large animal data. I've seen you know even some early clinical data serve as preliminary data. Um, to support the aims, um, and that wasn't too much. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, sure, sure. Okay. Um, I think it'll just kind of, you know, go, go as quickly as I can to the remainder of the slides here. Um, this, what we have on the screen right now is just kind of like a, a snapshot of um, just the, how long it takes. And, you know, I mentioned earlier, it's like six to seven months, um, you know, for to get from the time that you submit the application for funding in hand, because there's a lot of activity behind the scenes that needs to go on. Um, you know, the, the study sections need to assemble, it needs to go to, it needs to the application needs to be, you know, screened and sent to the right study section, and if it does well, then it goes, it goes to council. So, you know, this just kind of shows you in detail why it takes so long, um, you know, for, for, for this whole process. And um, sometimes it takes even in longer than seven months, again, just because there's some, uh, there may be some requirements uh, by the agency if they want to see like an IACUC or like an IRB approval um, if you're proposing, you know, animal or clinical studies respectively um, for your grant. So um, that's why it takes so long. So if we go to the next slide, slide 59, um, this is just kind of like a, a snapshot again uh, of, uh, you know, just uh, due dates to, to award dates. Um, and you know, how, how long it can potentially take. Um, and if we go to slide 60, um, I just want to go and 60 and a couple other slides, just kind of um, going over a, a couple of case studies. Um, I think there was a question asked earlier, you know, do we go SCI or STPR? So in this case, a small business is developing a, a therapeutic for hepatitis B, and the PI is primarily employed at the business. And the business wants to partner with the university to do some animal work. So would it be an SCIR or an STPR? So if you go to slide 61, you know, there, there really isn't a hard, uh, uh, you know, a right or wrong answer. It just, it, it really depends. So in, uh, again, as in both cases, an SCIR and STPR, your know, small business can partner with the research institution. But with an STPR, you're required to do it, and they have to eat up 30% of the budget. Um, so, you know, it really depends. Making the decision between SBR and STPR depends on, um, you know, your resources, and that includes people, like, you know, where the PI or PIs are, you know, where the resources are, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and, you know, if you're really, really not sure, even after considering all of that, then, you know, talk to the program officer. Um, so slide 62, um, you know, this, uh, this case study here is just uh, really about whether or not a PI is eligible for an FBIR. So here, uh, a researcher is primarily employed at a university, but wants to lead the project for an FBIR because he or she has the right biosketch. Um, that, you know, successfully led projects with a PI and a whole bunch of grants and, you know, there's probably, uh, in this case, a, a founder or co-founder of the technology and says, you know, I should be the PI of the SBIR. Um, and uh, if you go to slide 63, um, you know, in, in, in this case, uh, you know, for slide 63, um, 
I don't know if it's frozen. Can you guys hear me? Uh oh. Oh, there you go. In slide 63. Okay, you're great, great. Um, so in slide 63, um, if, uh, oh, wait, I think, uh, sorry, sorry, 64, slide 64. I maybe had a double, double slide there. Slide 64. Um, so, you know, if PI is employed primarily at the university, that PI, that person cannot be the, the PI for um, an SBIR grant. Um, you know, maybe at the time of application, uh, you know, you can do that, but at the time of award, um, that individual uh, needs to be primarily employed at the company. And, um, you know, sometimes the NIH and NSF check that, um, especially the NSF, they'll want to see things like um, employment contracts, payroll records, um, you know, to, to see if that person is primarily employed by the company. So if we go to, um, you know, what about, you know, the instance in, in STTR? So if you go to um, the next slide, um, you know, the, uh, in an STTR setup, um, the small business must take up at least 40% um, of the budget, and the research institution must take up 30%. So that 70%, so that remaining 30% is discretionary. So you can kick it back to the university or it can go to the company or an out, you know, another outside outsourced party. So if we go to um, you know, slide 66, I think I mentioned this a couple of times, it's very important for NSF if you're applying for that, the PI must be primarily employed uh, at the company at the time of awards. But with STTRs, you can have two PIs. Uh, you have a PI who's primarily employed at the business and a co-PI um, at the university who can remain employed primarily at the university. Um, in slide 67, um, I just wanted to kind of show you an actual rejection from a project pitch. Um, you know, this company, and you can read this all in detail later, but um, you'll see here, uh, you know, this company in particular that I know of um, was trying to fund um, a market research study for an already existing technology that um, that uh, has an app in on the Apple Store. So the NSF rejected it because um, it didn't seem like essentially um, there wasn't a high enough level of risk. Um, there wasn't enough R&D um, on the project. But you can take a look at this a little bit more carefully. But this is what you would get. Uh, from the NSF if you were not invited um, for the project pitch. So if we go to slide 68, um, there's just, uh, you know, some, I think I, I talked about this, you know, all these things already, but um, if you if you submit um, a project pitch, um, you can only resubmit it if you're uninvited um, or not invited rather for the next window, um, but you can submit two unique project pitches per fourth position window. So they're two completely different, um, you know, project uh, pitches. So um, I think in the interest of time, I'm just going to keep flipping through um, slides and you can read the rest of that later. But for um, slide 69, um, you know, we talked about, you know, budget caps. Um, I don't know if you guys can see slide 69. Okay, slide 69. Um, this is just, you know, essentially, um, you know, a company wants to uh, have a $300,000 uh, budget for some diabetes uh, technology. You know, is, is this is this um, allowable um, for, you know, um, for, for the SBIR project? And if you go to slide 70, uh, potentially. Um, so if you're applying for um, in, in slide 70, um, you know, if you want to go for a high budget, like I said earlier, there are some companies that have gotten $300,000, $500,000 phase one grants. Um, you know, you just have to see if your research is on the NIH topic waiver list. Um, I don't think, I don't, uh, is there a way to go to slide 70? Uh oh, there you go. Um, so, um, yeah, for the NIH, if there's a topic waiver list where you can exceed, um, you know, can have high budgets. So, but, you know, even if you are, if your technology is on the topic waiver list, just get the advice, just to be absolutely sure from your program officer. Um, and that's just for the NIH, but for NSF, they do have a hard cap. Um, slide 71 is 
almost last slide, um, I just kind of wanted to end here uh, emphasizing what company control facilities are. Again, that's that's required at the time of award and the best case scenario, you already have that space secured at the time of application, but most companies are not in that situation. And I understand, um, but you know, if you can paint it at letter of support, like Tamara mentioned, you know, maybe you can get space uh, letter support from ATI, um, you know, that definitely, that definitely helps in the application. So, so we're to slide 72. Um, you know, that's, uh, that's kind of like a, like an overview on the SBR and SBCR program. Um, and I can just open the, the floor to some questions at this time. Please, we do have one question. Okay. Yeah, um, this is getting a little bit into the details, but um, no problem. You mentioned, you mentioned that NSF and NIH, you can basically do a parallel application between the two agencies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is it also feasible for NIH alone? <clears throat> is it R also feasible to do an R01 application as well as the R43, R41, R42? Yeah. Um, is it possible? I mean, it's, it's definitely allowable. Um, I just wouldn't have any of the aims overlap. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I know with R01, um, R21s, like the, whatever NIH R grants, that's more, I mean, that's, those, those are grants that are, you know, uh, really academic type grants. Um, and, you know, those aims are um, written differently um, than, than SBIR grants. Um, so I guess the short answer is yes, you can, um, you know, they, they can be applied in parallel since the main applicants are different anyway. Um, you know, you might have the the technology might be might be the same technology across both applications, but just make sure that you you don't have overlapping aims. Okay. Okay. Um, in terms Anything of else? Yeah. Okay. In terms of uh, PI, um, so I'll, yeah. I will I will probably be the PI of the of the project, and uh, I'm not currently associated with any university anymore. Um, yeah, is that, yeah. Is that an issue or is that fine? Um, so you, you're saying you would be the PI primarily employed by the small business and yeah, you want well, to apply for a grant you want to know how that's perceived? Yeah, in well, I guess it'd be entirely employed by the, by the business. Yeah, so yeah. So you, you want to know if that's how that would be perceived? Yeah. Sure. So um, their viewers are going to look at how strong your bio sketch is. Right. Okay. So they're going to want to know. It's like it's like a resume, and right. you know, you're hiring a potential applicant. So you have to demonstrate that you have successfully uh, led projects in the past, mm -hmm. and that you can lead um, the technical research, and that can be evidenced from. Um, you know, if you had senior roles in, in other grants or maybe had senior roles at other startups um, for you know, demonstrated uh, leading a project, if you have publications in the field, that really helps, uh, or patents, if you're named on any patents. So basically, you just have to show, you have to prove that your experience is suitable for the research project. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions? Annalisa, this is Sherry. Um, Hi. So, sorry, Tamira and I were powwowing about a couple things here, so that's why we will slow on the slide. I'm going to go back to slide 65, and you may have addressed this while we were a little distracted, but slide 65, was that supposed to say at the top PI eligibility for FTTR? Because in the previous slide, you led to that. In the previous slide, you said, what about an NIH STTR? And then, is that what you were addressing here? I'm just trying um, to clarify. Okay. Yeah, for an STTR, um, the nonprofit research institution is required to do 30% of the work. Okay. So um, so the title on this one probably needed just just for clarification for people. The title on oh, this one. I'm just looking at sorry. the title at the top. Was this supposed yeah. to say FTTR? Yeah. 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 Yeah
PCR. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Yeah, I think I think it was because carry over from the previous slide. Yeah. So good catch. Thank you. Yep. Right, Thank right. you. You led to it from the previous slide. So okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Sorry. I know that's confusing. That's okay. Thanks. I just wanted to clarify that for folks. Sure. More questions? Great. Uh, one question. Can we send you information for our one-on-one -on -one so that you have a, had a chance to read, let's say, an executive summary of the company so you get a feel for what we're doing? Yeah. Um, I mean, you can certainly, you know, send it to me. I'll, you know, take um, you know, a, a quick look at it. Um, you know, so so long, you know, as long as I have time. But I, I will say I've I've had, you know. Uh, a number of meetings, you know, without having any information on hand. So feel free to send it to me, and I'll, I'll take a, a quick look. But if, for those who that can't send me anything, it's fine. Um, you know, we, we can we can definitely make it work. Great. Great. Well, so thank you questions? so much, everyone. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Annalisa. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.